program to bring you this important message. Yo, it's remember the show. Slick with the flows, where the sparring can go. Who's gonna be on, man? You never will know. Guess you better tune in, cause we live from Chicago. Bala Muhammad, that's the king of the tweets. Jason Anik looks like John, step his hands to his feet. Every Thursday, we gon' give you a treat. It's remember the show, hit play and repeat. Uh. And retweet, and retweet, and retweet, and retweet. It's remember the show, hit play and repeat. Huh. I hear you, Cody. Every Thursday, we're going to give you a treat. <clears throat> Man, is it good to be back. Remember the show, episode 117, my man Bilal Muhammad right in front of me, the UFC number one welterweight contender. Great to see you, man. It's been too long. Such a privilege to be able to talk fights today, man. How are you? Back in Chicago, you should be in Saudi Arabia, by the way, with <laughs> Nixick and that Ritz, but how are you, man? Young LA dripping. What's up, brother? My brother, yeah. It's been, it's been too long. We've had a, we had a while. Um, yeah, it just, you know, had a hard, hard couple of weeks. Uh, especially everything going on in Palestine and you know, the people out there were definitely praying for him every single day. And for the people that are following me on Instagram, continue to follow me, continue to share. And I love that people are like starting to ask questions and like, tell me, Yo, Hey, what is this? What's going on? What's happening there? And it's amazing when you have real fighters that are, that are seeking knowledge about it mm -hmm. um, because these are real people dying. These are real kids getting killed and real families losing their homes. So just doing nothing but praying. And for the people that are on here that are looking for pages to follow, follow Sean King on there, Omar Suleiman, where you're going to get real, real news. Um, it's rough because the world controls the narrative and you got, you know, presidents saying like the, the worst things. You're starting to see how evil the world really can be. And people are laughing at dead people, people laughing at kids dying. And it's crazy where you think this is like a movie or this is not real life. And you just feel like, guilty to even like talk about anything besides it but ah, it's always it's a blessing it shows you how blessed we are every single day we're alive and it makes you grateful for for the little things that you have in life that you always complain about uh because the people there they don't have nothing and they're still grateful every single day that they, they're they're waking up and they're alive and when you see those videos of those people and the stuff that they say and do it's it's nuts man you know, and I, I, on the pre-show when we were talking, I know you just saw my brother John in Abu Dhabi and I'm like, you know, talking to John when he gets talking, I'm like, how is Bilal, man? Like, how's he doing? You know, and just like seeing you guys like up there on stage and talking about fighting, it just, I don't know, man. It's just, uh, you know, when Hamza got on the microphone and just sort of, I think gave everyone some good perspective, it's just hard to, I'm glad we have this respite. I'm glad we can talk about it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's, it was amazing to see when you have fighters like that with that type of platform and the people who aren't even uh, Arab or Palestinian, like Hamza coming out there and saying it because it's, mm -hmm. it's a human thing. It's not even a Muslim thing or that thing or this thing. It's like Islam saying it, Muhammad Mukayyaf saying it, Javid Bashra saying it. Uh, you got guys like Jake Shields on Twitter that are posting nonstop about the situation. And I feel like even with him, he's, he's learned so much through it and he's teaching so much through it because he is neutral. He wasn't on either side. It's, it's crazy because when you have guys who do have the platform and they're they're spewing hate and they're spewing uh you know murderous threats and like do it kill more kill more kill more it just shows you how like despicable people are and like how godless a lot of these people are man it's rough man but we got to move on we're forced to talk about fighting and we don't mind it frankly it'll be good to dip our toe in a different water for a second so let's get right into it man and yeah Cody gave us the Abu Dhabi there. So um, Abu Dhabi, man, um, how long were you there? What was it like? Were you with Islam in his camp? How was, how was that whole week, week and a half? It was cool. We were there for, we were there for like a week. Um, and yeah, like literally the second day I'm there, it's like we're jet lagged and we're like eating. And then uh, Islam seems like, Hey, we're going to train in 10 minutes. So we go to <laughs> Habib's gym out there really nice. And then we get the, the training. And the first person I'm going with is the, the silver medalist. Uh, wrestler and he's like all right let's go and i was just like oh, okay uh so it was cool man anytime i get to, to train with those guys and see those guys it was cool to see and seeing uh islam and habib uh like working on stuff specifically for volk anytime you get to uh, like see greatness at work it was uh i learned a lot and just man, going, 
guys, man, it's being in that room with those guys is just uh, a blessing every single time. And it's like me and Lou love it every time because they, they bring us in no matter what. And they treat us like family. And uh, yeah, the Habib Jim's going to be something big. It's huge. It's nice over there. So anytime we get over there, we're going to be going, we're going to head to that gym every single night. And so Islam, I mean, like, you know, Habib's pupil, man, certainly one of the greatest mixed martial artists of all time. Stamp that. Um, just this guy do everywhere. He's great everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I said it beforehand. I was telling these people, I was like, bro, people sleep on his striking. His striking is really good. His kicks. And you see the adjustments he made from the first fight. He landed a lot of those kicks in the first fight to the body, to the leg, to the head. But the little tweaks uh, that his coach posted, it was like, his knee was straight up in this kick. Then, then, then now this kick, he drove in with his uh, with his knee, and it landed that much more powerfully. So to see that, to see that he's learning, to see that it shut up all the naysayers. People are still gonna say, "Oh, well, it was a weak notice, yada yada yada." But it was a run round fight. Whether you trained for five uh, weeks, six weeks, or one week, that kick was landing, and it was gonna it was gonna hurt him. And I think that Volk in general, I think he's susceptible to that kick because we've seen guys like. Yeah, you're landing that head kick on him. We've seen Islam in the first fight landing that head kick on him. It's kind of like a, a DC John Jones thing where DC was always susceptible to the left high kick. And people that were good, they saw it and they exploited it. I think that Islam's team just exploited it. And they saw it and they noticed something in it. And uh, they just attacked it. The way he did it, going low, 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 body high, uh, it was beautiful. So, you know, I'd like to talk about who his next fight will be, like Oliveira Gaethje. Islam, why why are you talking about Colby and Leon? <laughs> your, your, your boy came all the way to Abu Dhabi. Like, what are we doing, Islam? <laughs> Man, everybody wants just a piece of these big fights. I'm so sick of this. You got DC being like, McGregor should fight Mahashev. It's like, what are, like I understand the merge to the WWE, but make it stop, man. <laughs> yeah, no, it was funny to, to see that because even after the press conference, I saw him at the hotel and he was like, brother, they keep asking if I'm going to fight you. I was like, bro, you, you're the one who brought up 170. He said, brother, this exactly. guy called me out. Like, I'm like, Kobe knows what he's doing, right? Kobe knows how he just he knows that Leon's not gonna respond to him in any, in any of his play of trying to create trash talk or anything like that. So Kobe's putting it the the narratives out there for Islam, for Strickland, and he's throwing that out there to see which one sticks, to see which one he gets a response out of, because there's really no buildup for that fight right now. None, neither of these guys are talking, right? Kobe tried to talk his trash to, to yeah, Leon, but none. he's not gonna play that game. So it's like, oh well, let me get something out of one of these other guys, oh, Islam's going to respond out of it. <laughs> uh, so he gets a response out of him. But I think even now for Islam, I think that you have two huge fights. You have Oliveira and you have Justin Gaethje. And I think both of those fights are bigger fights for him than Kobe, even though being a double champ would be huge for him. But I think just to, uh, you know, cement himself, cement his legacy as one of the best lightweights to ever do it. I think that he would have to go through those two guys because those guys are huge names. They have huge followings. And people want to see those fights really bad. And especially mm -hmm. after seeing this head kick knockout, you want to see, all right, well, let's see what he does against what, these other guys too. Let's see if he finishes Oliveira in another way with just striking. Or let's see if he finishes Justin. I'd rather have him fight Justin because I feel like we did see the Oliveira fight uh, once before. And, you know, he yep. beat him dominantly. It wasn't a close fight like the Volkanovski fight. So I think the Justin fight, especially coming off a head kick knockout of Dustin Poirier, I think him and Justin would be huge. Oh, I agree. 100%. Moving on to NYC, Bilal Muhammad, my boy, and I will be there hosting extra rounds with TJ DeSanta somewhere probably outside the ceremonial way. And looking forward to seeing you. That's creeping UFC 295. So John Jones won't be in the building. Tore a pectoral tendon right off the bone. I saw the video evidence today. Stipe Miocic not going to take the interim title. Um, but I, we've talked about this on this show. Like, uh, and Cody, I talked to Cody about this earlier. He hated my response, but like, give me all of this new heavyweight championship between the two guys that are in their prime who frankly deserve to be fighting for it. I don't mind not getting this retirement little exhibition that we were going to get with all the respect to John Jones and Mia. It's like, I can't get enough of this. Uh, you got the literally the dream light heavyweight matchup for the, for the, which is now the main event. And then this co-main event, I can't get enough of it. Your thoughts. Yeah, honestly, it was like, it was crazy because Jared was like telling me how, how expensive the tickets were. And I was like, man, I wonder if they're going to give you guys a discount on the tickets now or like the price is going to go down. Right. Somebody bought a ticket for like $100,000 for that John Jones card. Um, wow. But I'm like, real fans, this is this is still a huge fight. This this main event uh, is already huge. And the co-main event now, Aspinall and Sergey is even better. I think it would be way more competitive. I thought John Jones was going to walk through Stipe. So I think this one right here is 
very competitive. And I understand it, why they didn't give it to Stipe or Stipe ended up fighting one of these guys. Because both these guys wanted to fight each other, right? The Stipe, who is considered by many to be the, the best heavyweight to do it. Like, you're going to lose that fight uh, if he goes out there and loses to one of these young guys. Uh, you're going to lose that fight with him and John Jones. So, I, I mean, if I'm Stipe, I want to wait for John Jones. If I'm John Jones, I'm hoping Stipe waits for me because that cements John Jones' legacy as being the best ever to do it if he walks through Stipe. Uh, and if I'm either one of them, I was like, yeah, I don't want to take a chance of losing to one of these younger, hot fighter, young guys that are coming up that are killers because both these guys are killers. So, that both the fact that both these guys stepped up and are fighting each other, it's it's crazy because I know Sergey was weighing in as a backup. So, I, I don't know how Aspinall was training or – or working toward anything, but the fact that he he accepted it tells me how good he is. Yeah, you got to think Aspinall staying in good shape after that knee, man. You know, you got to think. I mean, he's ready. But like, you know, when you talk about staying in shape, and I was on the Anakin Florian podcast for a short bit while we were dark over these few weeks, and it's like I was just curious the shape Volk would be in and Usman, and yeah, Volk had a little little fat hanging over the belt there, man. Like you didn't see that in the last fight, even at one fifty five against Islam. You know, and no disrespect to Islam, but it's like where are you all at? You know, yeah, um, and I tell these guys it's like. It's different, right? Because you saw the little pudge with Volk. So obviously you're like, okay, maybe the weight cut didn't go as well. And even for myself and that, the, the fight with Gilbert Burns, I didn't look as shredded as normally as I do because, you know, you're not doing the full uh, weight training camp or anything like that. But I thought, you know, you really couldn't see how much of good shape in Volk was in because it was a finish in the first round. So right, right. Like, People could use their excuses on Islam and be like, oh, well, it wasn't, you know, it was just short, yada, yada, yada. But I'm like, he finished him in the first round. So I don't think any of that noise really matters. And Volk accepted a fight. When me and Lou uh, talked about our fight with Gilbert Burns, we were like, if we accept this fight, there's no excuses. We accept it. There's not, yep. oh, we took it on three weeks notice or did this or that. Or it's like, he's like, how you feel? You say yes, put everything else out of your head. We don't come into this fight, even with interviews saying, oh, well, you know, we do we don't know what kind of shape we're in. Maybe we do this, maybe we do that. We're like, we're doing this. We're going to say five rounds because that's what we're committing to. And we're going all in with everything. Speaking of five rounds, am I correct in saying that Usman was offered, potentially could have done a five round fight here. And he looked to be, you know, like if you ask me who was coming off the couch less, it was Usman, Usman or Volk. It looked more like Usman was ready to go. Certainly could have gone five rounds. Loved what I saw. Round one wasn't necessarily a 10 8 to my eyes. Um, so that was interesting. I mean, could he have had five rounds if he wanted? Is that is there truth to that? Yeah, yeah. I was talking with his team and his management. I even talked to Usman. He said, Yeah, I should have did five rounds. I guess he had the opportunity, uh, the option to make it five rounds. And uh, he just wasn't sure how, what type of shape he was going to be in, especially moving up to 185. Uh, what level his cardio would be at. But he's like, I should have just had confidence in myself and, and went five rounds because I'm a five-round fighter. And you could tell it, even in in a three-round fight, one little mistake can cost you. Like that, that he defended the first couple takedowns with Hamza, then all of a sudden he gave up his back and Hamza jumped right on it and he had his back the whole, uh, the rest of the round and in a dominant position. Like, I don't know if it was a 10-8 because it was like, there was, there was damage there, but it wasn't like nonstop damage. He was defending the chokes a lot of the time. Uh, but it was, de it was definitely a dominant round. Um, yeah. And, you know, the second round, I think both of them took off. I think that Hamza was trying to recover, and I don't, I'm pretty sure Usman was trying to recover because defending his back that, that long, having a guy on your back the whole time, you were tired. And then the third round, Usman started to, to let loose a little bit more. And Hamza got that takedown uh, yeah. to end the round, and Usman got back up. It, it was definitely a close fight, but I, I for sure gave it to, to Hamza. I would have definitely wanted to see it if it was a five-round fight to see mm -hmm. where it would have gone. Yep. Uh, because I don't know if Hamza's hand was uh, broken or not. I don't know if they came out with the, the testing of that or not. But sometimes even if your hand's not broken, like you get bone bruises or something like that. So maybe it was just a pain in general. Uh, but he showed it. Honestly, he showed – Usman, regardless, uh, you could say he's fighting, a, he beat a 170 pounder, but Usman was a guy that was willing to go up to 205. I think he beat uh, a champion like that. And to have his back in that first round, it tells me how good Hamzat is in the first round. I think there's not like a better first round fighter than, than Hamzat Chamaya. Like he could be the best first round fighter ever, uh, first <laughs> round fighter ever. And then you have to get, but it get, leaves the door open for other guys too, right? Where it's like, let me just get out of this first round and see where we're at. Yeah. So, 
Chimaev, Strickland, Duplessis. I mean, I, I mean, certainly Chimaev is, is going to fight for the belt. I mean, is that what you see happening, Chimaev, Strickland? And if so, uh, I'm sure you like Chimaev to beat his ass, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dana said it, so like I was, uh, I would definitely give it to Chimaev. I think he earned it. You beat yeah. a champion, you beat a champion like that. You took a fight on a couple weeks' notice, yep. uh, new opponent. Yeah, you have to give it to him. And yeah, man, I think Chimaev will walk through him. And this is an open invitation, Chimaev. Hit me up if you need me to help you train for for Strickland, because like I want to see you walk through him. I want to see you freaking dominate him. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully we do that, and he he does walk through him. I think that we seen him in a boost fight when Strickland fought him. A boost took him down uh, and had him in a couple of bad spots, and even on the feet, a boost was doing well in the first round, but Strickland just ended up weathering the storm and getting through it. But I think Chimaev, I think they trained together a couple of times at Extreme Couture, and you know from the cryptic messages from Chamayev saying that, you know how easy I finish you. And maybe at practices, he knows that he dominated him in grappling or anything like that. So I can't wait for that fight. You know, it's going to be uh, a crazy buildup. And uh, I think that Chamayev ended up with the belt. I love it. So I should have reached out to Eric Nixick and told him, be like, you got to make sure Bilal does not come home, bring him to Saudi. <laughs> you got to be in that camp. But anyway, this weekend, man, I can't wait. So, so Nixick, man, he got shaved his head, he's getting hair. I love it. Um, so, so, um, but just please tell me like that Francis has a real shot to connect here. Like I see that, that, but I mean, is Fury just jab him to death and this is just going to be the not worth my money or can Francis like, like hit him in that soft body and, or crack something. I mean, do you have a shot, man? You know, I love Eric and I love, uh, whenever I met Francis, he was like the nicest guy in the world. So like, I don't want to see him get, embarrassed or hurt or anything like that i just think that fury is the best boxer uh, in the world and he's he's dealt with when people look at francis say oh he has that one punch power that one punch opportunity to anybody can get caught with one punch but it's like fury just beat the the best one punch power guy in the world uh and deontay wilder and he like figured it out after the first fight they fought each other and second fight all right he wear it on him drained him and francis has one punch power but it's four ounce gloves that he's knocking guys out with. We haven't seen him with boxing gloves. If it's eight ounce or 12 ounce gloves that they're, they're using, <clears throat> that, that changes everything. And Fury knows how to block those punches with those gloves. You don't have those little tiny openings like you do with MMA gloves on. You, you have a different type of shield, different type of thing. So it's, it's a different type of movement. You're punching with uh, shoes on now. And like, I don't know. I, just, I don't think that Francis is going to be at that level. Like, even seeing him like hitting pads and boxing and stuff like that. It's like, there's not that same fluidity that you get with guys like Fury who looks like he's just dancing in there and having fun in there. And uh, he's it has to be that comfortable knowing that he's going to walk through him. If he's has another fight booked for a couple months later against right. Usyk. It's like, that just tells me that if Francis is coming here with uh, a chip on his shoulder or, uh, you know, taking it personally, he's going to come out harder, but I don't know if that's going to make him drain a little bit more. Or if you or if Fury pulls the Mayweather and he lets you, you know, stay in there for the, for a little bit longer into the eighth, ninth, tenth round, then he lets you go because he wants to put on a show for you a little bit. But like, did you think McGregor? Like, I thought McGregor showed well for himself against Floyd. Did you? Did you not? Yeah, yeah, I thought he did. Yeah, for sure. But it's it's different, right? Because McGregor has that fluidity in his movement. He has yeah. good movement, good footwork. Uh, Francis is so big, man. It's it's <laughs> like even when he's walking, he just looks like stiff. <laughs> So you, he doesn't have that same thing. And especially at, you. You know, Floyd is going to – Floyd allowed McGregor to get off a little bit, right? He took, he took a lot of his punches and he let him play with him a little bit. When you're at that big at heavyweight, you can't let this other guy play with you or, or hit you that hard. So I don't think – I don't know if Fury is going to give him the opportunity to do it or Fury is going to just come out there and, you know, want to embarrass him and show you guys that I told you I'm the baddest man in the world. Look what I did to your heavyweight champion to, to show, like, the UFC and stuff, like how good he is or how great he is. It just comes out there with the type of guy that Fury is and the type of uh, game plan he's going to come out with. Because, yeah, McGregor looked well in there. But, like, when Floyd turned it up and he wanted to, he said, I was just waiting until the 10th round to, to do it. So, like, I, I, he did it. So, like, I, I just don't know what type of guy Fury – what kind of game plan Fury is going to come with. Yeah. Hey, just, just Francis, just protect yourself at all times, if nothing else. Like, But for Eric Nixick to make that walk in that type of environment, I can't wait to see that, you know? Yeah, it's, it's so going to be cool. huge, especially for all the doubters and the haters and the people that laughed at Francis. And it's like, he's here now. The fight's here. The people thought it was never going to happen. 
Uh, they doubted him. They they laughed at him. And you know what? Uh, Nixick posted that video of the bag. He fumbled the bag and he posted like a picture of yeah, like, yeah. A bag with it on there. It's like uh, you know he's gonna be rich. But I don't think he has. Like I don't think he's the, he has the mindset of like I'm just happy to be there. I think Francis really wants to go in there and, and win, and I think he has to come out there. Like you don't want to pull a little Dennis and just look stupid in there and just cover the whole time and not fight at all. It's like go out there and throw, even if you get knocked out or you go, at least you went out on your shield. I love it. So, dude, speaking of going out on your shield, you know, obviously we'd love to see you fight as soon as humanly possible. It's interesting when you talk about the lack of buildup for that welterweight championship, right? I mean, it is creeping. And imagine how much stuff you'd be talking right now. Imagine the way in which you'd be running your mouth. Imagine the type of stuff you'd be putting out there. And it is just so interesting. And it's hard for me to imagine that they're going to actually fight still. Um, you know, Cody's telling me, oh, Co rumors, Colby's out, Palau in, you know. Um, but so where are you at? I know it's been a crazy few months, um, but how, I know you're embedded in training, but what's what's going on? How you doing? How's your training? Where are you at? Yeah, I mean, for me, like you said, you're, you're looking at it and you're seeing the last two main events for the UFC, big pay-per-views get changed and anything's possible. So like, my mindset was, all right, get as much training as possible. And especially now getting back to America, time zone change is bad, but uh, the jet lag is killing. But I'm like, we got to get into training mode right now. Uh, so we're not in full camp mode, but we're, we're training hard. We're waiting for that call. If anything happens, anything happens. Uh, they never called us to be any backup or anything like that. People were asking a million times, like, what's going to happen? Who's next for you? It's like, Usman just fought Chamaya. There's nobody else for me to fight. So... This fight is right around the corner, so we're going to be next in line and wait for it. That's all that there is for me to do. Uh, so I'm just going to keep training, keep keep grinding out. Both these guys are southpaws. Both these guys are similar in size for me to train for. So there's nothing that it's like if they call me, hey, two weeks, do you want to take this fight? It's not like I have to bring somebody in. We're working for it. And if anything happens, I'm going to be ready. I know who you think is the easier matchup, but I, it'd be interesting to do a poll because I'm not so I'm not sure who I'd rather see you face. Just because I they're, they're you know really at the top of my list of Colby was always at the top of my list of the guy I wanted you to face, even when you were ranked let's say ten in the world. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So obviously Leon may be the the rematch component, but it'd be fascinating to see a poll because I know I think you I know you think Colby's an easier matchup. Um, but I feel like for your legacy, you'd maybe rather face Leon if forced to choose. Yeah, I did a Q&A in Abu Dhabi, and they were like, who would you rather face? And I said, for my legacy, for sure, I would rather oh, face Oh, really? Leon. Yeah, literally, that's what I said. I, I said didn't it, see it. I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke. No, yeah. I said I'd rather face Leon for my legacy because I go out there and I beat Leon, who beat Usman twice. It's, I'm, my resume is up there with the best welterweights in the world to ever do it. Best up there with GSP. And people are like, LOL, Gio, up there with GSP. And I'm looking at them like, I beat Damian Maya, who's considered the best grappler to ever do it. He fought for the title twice at 185 and 170. I beat Wonderboy. He fought for the title twice at welterweight. I beat Gilbert Burns, who fought for the title at welterweight and considered one of the best jiu-jitsu guys to ever do it. I beat Luke, who weighed in as a backup for the title and one of the best finishers at welterweight. I beat Sean Brady, who's undefeated at the time, 15-0, supposed to be this killer, this monster. And I dominated him and finished him. And he has a false system, but I think he's going to continue to win since then. So you're going to tell me that I'm not good. My resume is not good enough to go up there with GSP, who, what did we beat? Josh Koscheck, uh, Johnny Hendricks, who Wonderboy dominated, and I dominated Wonderboy. It's like, I'm not trying to bring somebody else down to lift myself up, but my resume is going to be up there with the best of the world once I had that belt. Because people are going to look for any reason to, to hate on me and say that, oh, this guy's just talking or this guy's yada, yada, yada. But just look at the stats. Even now, look at the stats. Now that Usman got taken down uh, four times in that fight, I'm the I had the best uh, takedown defense in the welterweight history, and I had the best uh, and third best in all time history behind John Jones and Julio Arce, which I don't even know why Julio Arce was number two. Hey. I didn't realize that, but hey, I'm number three behind uh, John Jones in all time. Hey, so, UFC, put those stats. You're, you're not going to not put those stats up just because my boy's at the top of the list, okay? Yeah, put those yeah. stats up, all right? Yeah, and that's funny how they move up to number two now in, in the rank, welterweight rankings. I'm like, oh, now they move up number two after the Kobe fight's already booked. Uh, and the, the, now they can't use the excuse anymore that, well, Kobe's ahead of them in the rankings. That's why we're giving <laughs> Kobe the next shot. So I'm like, Dude. it doesn't really matter to me anymore because 
I know how good I am and I know where we are. We got to this point in our life by just grinding it out and, you know, shutting people up and not listening to the doubters and the haters. And we just kept stayed in our own lane and kept our small circle. And um, we stayed the course and we stayed the course. We stayed the course. We stayed the course, whether people believe in me or not, or people doubt me or not, or people hate on me or not. We're just going to keep winning. We're going to keep beating all these guys that you guys say I can't beat. And once I'm, my name's up there as being the best welter rate to ever do it, then you guys are finally going to give me the respect that I deserve. Just unbelievable how little respect there is for such a long winning streak. Like name, name a guy that's beat Bilal Muhammad, you know, like, <laughs> tick, 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 you know, you know, yeah. Preach. What's up, Aaron? Appreciate you. Um, but what we always said was, was we just wanted a date and then everything can fall in place, right? It's so much easier probably to go through your day-to-day -day life knowing that date's there than a couple months back when we're just like, are these dudes ever going to fight? You know, cause we knew you were waiting. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We were, we were, we were sitting there and we were waiting and then, you know, they offer the Usman fighting. You're like looking at it like, all right, man, we got to go through another hurdle. We got to do this one more thing. Then Usman ends up fighting Chimaev. So you're like, all right. This is meant to be. We're we're meant to to be this fight. And you got guys like Justin Gaethje now who are coming out and saying, "Oh, well, I'm gonna wait. There's nobody else for me to to fight. So if Oliveira fights Islam, I'm gonna wait for that fight because he's earned it. And you know how hard it is to get to this one spot to fight for the the UFC title. It's one of the hardest things you could do to even get into the top ten is a hard thing to do. To get into the top five is a hard thing to do. But to actually compete for the world title is one of the hardest things it is to take to get to that point because. We've seen it in all these fights, how easy it is to lose, how easy it is to get hurt, how easy it is in a training camp to get hurt, to go into fight injured. And all it takes is one wrong move and you lose. And even the best in the world lose. Both considered the best pound pound fighter in the world gets head kicked in the first round. Yep. And it's that easy to lose in this game. So for me to have a streak with, you know, 10 names on there and five of those names are top five fighters in the world. And I beat those guys and dominate those guys uh, for people to still sit there and doubt me. You know, they're just, that just tells me that you're just a hater. You're not even like, you don't even have like a, a real thinking cap on or no bias in, in your, in your thoughts. You're just truly a hater. Yeah. Well, all those haters are going to have another opportunity to watch you fight. Uh, and the belt will be on the line and they will be printing. They write the challenger. They do print that black and gold. Cause they got to put it on you once you, once you, you know, get the belt. So that stuff is going to be printed. It's going to be printed at some point. We like to think it's going to be put on as well. Anyway. We're happy to be back with y'all on Remember the Show. We will be back every Thursday, 3.30 Eastern, 2.30 Central. Shout out the boys from Young L.A. Giordano. Oh, my brother, look at you. Oh, they hooked me up. They hooked me up. I did make a mistake. My brother and I, a little smaller. We got a lot of this large stuff. We maybe should have gone medium, but this stuff is so fresh, bro. All of it is unbelievable. My wife is getting home just like this stuff is incredible. So yeah, shout yeah, out the boys from Young L.A. Dude, they're building, they're building an empire, man. It is incredible what they're doing. So... Shout out those boys for the great Cody Mero running the show. And my boy, Bilal Muhammad, my name is Jason Anik. We'll see you next Thursday. Enjoy the fights. No fights this weekend. Enjoy Nixick. Later. <laughs>